Yesterday's reading was rather short, and I told you it would be, because today's would be rather long. So settle in. We pick up with the crew and a few passengers from the Mayflower exploring Cape Cod. The month of November being spent in these affairs and much foul weather falling in. The 6th of December, they sent out their shallop again with 10 of their principal men and some seamen upon further discovery, intending to circulate that deep bay of Cape Cod. The weather was very cold and it froze so hard as the spray of the sea lighting on their coats, they were as if they'd been glassed. Yet that night, betimes they got down into the bottom of the bay and as they drew near the shore, they saw some 10 or 12 Indians very busy about something. They landed about a league or two from them and had much ado to put ashore anywhere. It lay so full of flats. Being landed, it grew late and they made themselves a barricade with logs and boughs as well as they could in the time and set out their sentinel and betook them to rest and saw the smoke of the fire the savages made that night. When morning was come, they divided their company, some to coast along the shore in the boat, and the rest marched through the woods to see the land, if any fit place might be for their dwelling. They came also to the place where they saw the Indians the night before, and found they had been cutting up a great fish like a grampus, being some two inches thick of, of fat like a hog, some pieces whereof they had left by the way. And the shallop found two more of these fishes dead on the sands, a thing usual after storms in that place by reason of the great flats of sand that lay thereof. So it sounds like it might have been a seal or something like that. So they ranged up and down all that day, but found no people, nor any place they liked. When the sun grew low, they hasted out of the woods to meet with their shallop, to whom they made signs to come to them into a creek hard by, the which they did at high water, of which they were very glad, for they had not seen each other all the day since the morning. So they made them a barricado, Barricade. I, I love that barricado stuff. You can tell they're picking up the words from Spanish and importing them into English. Either way, they made a barricade. As usually, they did every night. With logs, stalks, and thick pine boughs, the height of a man, leaving it open to leeward, partly to shelter them from the cold and wind, making their fire in the middle and lying round about it, and partly to defend them from any sudden assaults of the savage if they should surround them. So, being very weary, they betook them to rest. But about midnight, they heard a hideous and great cry, and their sentinel called, Arm! Arm! So they bestirred them and took to their arms and shot a couple of muskets, and then the noise ceased. They concluded it was a company of wolves, or such like wild beasts. For one of the seamen told them he had often heard such a noise in Newfoundland. So they rested till about five of the clock in the morning. For the tide and their purpose to go from thence made them be stirring betimes. So, after prayer, they prepared for breakfast, and it being day dawning, it was thought best to be uh, carrying things down to the boat. But some said it was not best to carry the arms down. Others said they would be the readier, for they had lapped them up in their coats from the dew. But some three or four would not carry theirs till they went themselves. Yet, as it fell out, the water being not high enough, 
they laid them down on the bank side and came up to breakfast. But presently, all of a sudden, they heard a great and strange cry, which they knew to be the same voices they heard in the night, though they varied their notes. And one of the company being abroad came running in and cried, men, Indians, Indians. And with all their arrows, oh, and with all, their arrows came flying amongst them. Their men ran with all speed to recover their arms, as by the good providence of God they did. In the meantime, of those that were there ready, two muskets were discharged at them, and two more stood ready in the entrance of their rendezvous. But they were commanded not to shoot till they could take full aim at them. And the other two charged again with all speed, for there were only four. Um, charged in this case doesn't mean they were charging at them. Charged means to load the guns. They defended the barricado, which was first assaulted. The cry of the Indians was dreadful especially when they saw their men run out of the rendezvous towards the shallop to recover their arms, the Indians wheeling about upon them. But some, running out with coats of mail on and cutlasses in their hands, they soon got their arms and left, left fly amongst them and quickly stopped their violence. Yet there was a lusty man, and no less valiant, stood behind a tree within half a musket shot, and let his arrows fly at them. He was seen to shoot three arrows, which were all avoided. He stood three shot of a musket, till one taking full aim at him, and made the bark or splinters of the tree fly about his ears, after which he gave an extraordinary shriek, and away they went, all of them. They left some to keep the shallop and followed them about a quarter of a mile and shouted once or twice and shot of two or three pieces and so returned. This they did, that they might conceive that they were not afraid of them or any way discouraged. Thus, it pleased God to vanquish their enemies and give them deliverance and by his special providence, so to dispose that not any one of them were either hurt or hit, though their arrows came close to them, and on every side of them, and sundry of their coats which hung up in the barricado were shot down through and through. Afterwards, they gave God solemn thanks and praise for their deliverance, and gathered up a bundle of their arrows, and sent them into England afterward by uh, them of the ship, uh, excuse me, and by the master of the ship, and called that place the first harbor. And therefore, I'm sorry, and called that place the first encounter. From hence they departed and coasted all along, but discerned no place likely for harbor, and therefore hasted to a place that their pilot, one Mr. Coppin, who had been in the country before, did assure them was a good harbor, which he had been in, and they might fetch it before night, of which they were glad, for it began to be foul weather. We'll stop there for now.